Let me restart our recording. And thank you everybody for being here with us. Um, I would expect that we'll have probably a few more attendees as has been the case throughout the week uh, that come in throughout the sessions. And I am very thankful that we have had a, a really wonderful, successful week. This is our last uh, day of the RET in Africa Research Colloquium. And with us today, we have Jan Van Art, who is professor in the Chester F. Carlson Center for Imaging Science of the RET College of Science. Uh, and we have uh, Joy Alabasi, who is associate professor. Uh, hi, Joy, I see you coming on there. Uh, and perfect, here comes Ladia. So we have Joy, Dr. Joy Alabasi, associate professor in the Department of Management of uh, our Saunder, RET Saunders College of Business. And we also have uh, here with us, it's so nice to, to see and, and meet you, um, Dr. Eladia Griffin. Oh, I apologize if I, didn't, if I didn't pronounce your name correctly, um, of Robert Morris University. Uh, so to start us off, we, we will begin with Dr. Van Art and I will turn it over. You should have screen share to work well, and I will spotlight you here so that we can begin. Thank you, everybody, for being here, and, and a special thanks to, um, to Jan, Joy, and Eladia for uh, your wonderful presentations today. You're muted, Jan. Doesn't want me to share screen. Uh, open oh, system what preferences. Is, I okay. Don't know. I don't know what is That's happening strange. with us today. Here you go, try again. I will just make some quick changes and you should be good now. Apologize. Let's try again. Oh, there we go. Oops. Okay. Yeah, so you should be able to see my screen. Yes, it's great. Okay, so uh, I've got a, a quite a few slides, but most of them are pictures. Uh, so I'll just um, start with it and, and feel free to interrupt me. I mean it, it's a very casual presentation and I assume a casual crowd. So feel free of you if you have questions or if you post a question maybe in the chat, then, then you know, I can I can pick up on that. Um, so so long story short is I, I'm Jan van Aert. I'm from South Africa originally. I uh, came to the States in 1998 for graduate studies. Always thought I uh, would uh, stay here. Oh, sorry, go back to South Africa. You know, I love South Africa. Um, but I, I, I always joke with people, I say we became sissies in the United States. Uh, it's such a, a wonderful environment in terms of safety, security, uh, opportunity, and so on. And so we, we, my wife and I became sissies, I think. So we went back to South Africa for a few years after grad studies. Um, but we came stateside in 2008 formally uh, to, to make our, our home and our future year. So I still do a lot of projects as much as I can in South Africa, often for selfish reasons, because I really want to get back there and work with the scientists in South Africa. So I'll just talk to you a little bit about some of the remote sensing projects that we do in, in, in Southern Africa and specifically in South Africa. And I just want to acknowledge a host of, of co-authors and, and also acknowledge them toward the end. They, they are instrumental at, in, in actually making this possible. So just a brief overview of what I'm going to talk to you about. Just briefly tell you, we are here in, in, in RIT's Chester F. Carlson Center for Imaging Science and also tell you a little bit about the context of what I do there and then dive into some specific projects with a quick summary slide uh, very briefly. So Center for Imaging Science and our subgroup within the center is called the Digital Imaging and Remote Sensing Group. So imaging science is everything. My, my, my boss always points to the camera on his cell phone. And he says, this is imaging science. Everything that has to do with uh, photons collected through the optics onto the detector play, the plane, uh, displaying an image, making sense of that image, maybe morphing the image in a funny face, you know, or, or extracting information about that image and then displaying it for human, um, basically, consumption. That's, that's imaging science, and we call this the imaging chain. Now, granted, I, can you see my mouse? Yes, I can. Okay, so I, I, work, um, I work very much in this processing and algorithm side towards the application side of imaging science. That's where I find myself at, and my, my background really is forestry. So I'm a fish out of water in imaging science. I'm surrounded by engineers and physicists 
and my background, as I said, is, is, is um, pretty much forestry. So what is imaging science uh, from a remote sensing perspective? Here, you're looking at a true color image of RIT's campus. And here you will see two fields. You'll see the, the track with real grass, and you'll see a lacrosse field or a soccer field with uh, astroturf or fake grass, right? And viewing them in visual RGB, uh, typical true color representation, they look exactly the same. But if I display this image with near infrared imagery displayed as red, this is what happens. And essentially what you're seeing is you're seeing real grass reflecting near infrared imagery. I know it looks red, but what's red here is actually near infrared, if that makes any sense. So grass or vegetation reflects a lot of near infrared energy. AstroTurf does not. It absorbs that near infrared energy, so it shows up as dark. And I'm showing you this because I want to sort of convey the idea that we use a lot of invisible wavelengths, to the human eye anyway, to, to extract information about vegetation, health, uh, moisture status, disease, biomass, things like that. And that's what we do in remote sensing, especially for vegetation by and large. So I sit in the digital imaging remote sensing group. It's a pretty large group in terms of, of just faculty members, as well as research staff. At any given time, we have about 40 ongoing research programs that or projects that support the equivalent number of, of graduate students, MS and PhD. Um, a pretty significant for a small research group in terms of annual research revenue with a host of, of funding agencies that you can see there from the government defense labs to NASA, NSF, USDA, United States Department of Agriculture, etc. So it's a pretty extensive group. And I'm not going to read everything here, but what we do is we exploit remote imagery. We try and develop algorithms for whatever user purpose. We sit very much on the the physics and application science. They are the folks who understand vegetation and the physiology, and that, that often wants very complex um, products to better understand their system with. And that's where remote sensing and imaging, uh, you know, come into play. We try and work with these folks to, to develop um, products for their use. For instance, a typical imaging science graduate student <coughs> could do his or her PhD in remote sensing and go work at Apple in the iPad display environment. As an imaging scientist, they need to be able to adapt their skills to whatever use case or interest than a client might have, if that makes any sense. Then I just quickly want to show you one of the sensing modalities that we use, because this is sort of prime and center in all the projects that I'll be discussing. It's called light detection and ranging, or LIDAR. And I think many of you are familiar with that. You even find it in vehicles these days. But essentially, it's a laser that scans across the flight path of an, of an aircraft, and that pulses, laser pulses, that are coupled to GPS units so that I can extract 3D information of a target. So each point, we we'll call it an X and a Y for spatial positioning and Z for height. Each point has um, a very spatial explicit nature to it that can actually characterize the 3D structure of an environment. And this is what you get. You get a, a 3D point cloud, we call it. And here you will see blue points representing a ground surface. The red points you can sort of, if you squint and and imagine you can sort of see the trees in here. You can see some lower lying brush and even some shorter vegetation here. So this is what a LiDAR point cloud look, look, looks like. And then this is what we use to extract structural information about ecosystems specifically. And we'll talk more about this as we, as we progress. In terms of ecology, I'm not an ecologist. Um, and, and ecologists are nerds, if you want to believe me. They often want really complex interesting products with which to assess ecological dynamics. Um, I'm, I think we don't often give them enough credit. We think of an ecologist as someone out there in the woods counting bugs and measuring trees and so on, but the type of products that they're after are, are truly complex. And then I think that's where, why they sort of gravitate towards imaging and remote sensing specifically. So what, what do ecologists typically want? They, they look at things like structure, what does it look like? What does it feel like? Think a tree height, crown dimensions. 
What does it do? What is the function of that plant in the ecosystem? You can think of grass in a savanna ecosystem. The function of that is obviously forage for wildlife, but also nutrient cycling on an annual basis of all the de via the decomposition of roots and, and cycling of nutrients back into the soil. And then composition, which species occur there? And how, how, do, how does composition, function, structure, how, how do all of these interact? And very important, scale. I could be looking at a, an organism, a tree, to a, a landscape, uh, you know, of a few hectares to a, a whole region. So the scaling becomes a really interesting problem. So that's what I want to sort of show here. Here you see sort of um, an example of a savanna ecosystem. Savanna being defined as a continuous layer of grass with interspersed tree canopy. And you can see a, call it a natural state ecosystem savanna versus a human impacted savanna. And obviously the differences are pretty obvious. So for you and I to walk through a site like that, it's, it's obvious, but how do I scale this to landscapes that I can actually characterize in a spatial manner through map products derived from remote sensing? What kind of the dynamics have been happening in this ecosystem? And there's a lot of, I would say, hardcore scientific questions here, just in terms of the functioning, the structure, the composition of the ecosystem, but there's also a lot of socioeconomic you know, questions that, that we work with that's, that's really interesting, especially in a place like Southern Africa and Africa at large, I would argue. So we often lack this sort of spatial detail, right? We, when we, when we wanna measure the dynamics in a field site, we physically go there, we take a diameter tape, measure the diameter of the tree, we measure the height of the tree, we weigh the grass, but it's only for that location. So the question really becomes if, if I'm measuring and looking at a tree, this is an elephant damaged tree for the record. I, I can visit that tree in that site, but that all it tells me is about that very spatially explicit location. How do I scale this to an entire landscape and map human impacts, animal dynamics and impacts, et cetera. So that's the, the, the core challenge in, in a lot of what we do in ecology. And we can do, do remote sensing to, to address this. Here are just some examples of imagery. Obviously you're looking at sort of the Southwestern tip of Africa and you can sort of see a beautiful image uh, taken from space uh, satellite. And then you can see on the, on the left here, I don't even know where this is for the record, but two images, one in a true color representation and one where we actually assign invisible, we call it shortwave or near infrared bands. We assign these near infrared bands to be represented by blue, green, and red on my screen. And you can see how this image on the left comes alive because now I'm suddenly mapping mineral distributions. And sure, I can see some mineral, I would say, sort of textures and colors in this upper image. But here I'm starting to really characterize and differentiate between different mineral, mineral depositions in this mining area. So remote sensing is a very powerful tool for that. I can look at the Amazon. Here you can see sort of a typical pattern attributed to deforestation. Now you can imagine, I can now look at a satellite image from 1990, and I can then look at a satellite image from 2000, 2010, 2020, and I can see the progression in deforestation. I can track this through monitoring, through what we call just time series analysis. So remote sensing is an extremely powerful tool to track dynamics in the ecosystem at pretty large scales. We can look at degradation and changes in ecosystems. You're obviously looking at a map of the United States and, and this is a, a product derived from an, a sensor called MODIS. It's a NASA based sensor. And what you're looking at here color coded is, is a fraction of photosynthetically active or absorbed radiation. So essentially you're looking in redder colors of very active vegetation, growing vegetation. The redder, the more it actually absorbs photosynthetic radiation. In other words, the visible part of the spectrum because that's what plants use for, for photosynthesis. And you can take this product and convert it into a map like this. Now you're looking at gross primary production. So you're looking at the very productive sort of Southern deciduous forest versus also in the Sierra Nevada, some of those forests are highly productive. And as you come to upstate New York and even Canada, it becomes slightly less productive because we live in colder climates. So you can actually map the productivity of an ecosystem using remote sensing. So I'm gonna now talk to you a little bit about uh, specific scientific uh, projects. And, and these were done with a, a host of people and collaborators, um, namely uh, the Council for Scientific and Industrial Research, the University of the Witwatersrand, 
or WITS, it's a pretty famous local university in Johannesburg, South Africa, RIT obviously, South African National Parks, and they're very importantly, Carnegie Institution for Science. They are actually the folks who provided a lot of the sensing ability and analysis for this. And, and I'll talk about them in a little bit. They're, they've become quite famous. Um, sorry, I just wanna minimize that. I, okay. They've become quite famous in, in, in leading the way in global ecological mapping. Specifically, their PI is a guy called uh, Greg Asner, and he's one of the heavy eaters in our field. So what do we do? So Kruger National Park is an is a area that's been very well studied because it's a, it's a natural environment. Yes, it's managed for, for tourism as well, but they manage it very ecologically sound. So the, the management doesn't really interfere with the system too much. They let the, the animals and the plants do their thing unless there's a, a, a skewness happening in say an elephant population where they need to intervene. But there's a lot of questions, again, back to the scaling of how you take landscapes like this and, and, and do sensing so you can scale it across the park. And it's a, it's a pretty big park, but you'll, you'll see it in a second. So in 2008, Greg Asner uh, reached out to the Council for Scientific and Industrial Research and said, my boss, uh, Chris Fields was his name at uh, Carnegie Institution for Science, really fell in love with Kruger National Park. And he sort of said, I should uh, hook up with folks, scientists in Africa and come and fly my fancy spectrometers or sensors and the LIDAR sensor, that 3D sensing sensor. And uh, we can address some science questions. So we really wanted to sort of see, flex our muscle and sort of see what can we achieve with this cutting edge, these cutting edge te te technologies. And uh, the primary research activities were related to plant animal interactions, fire dynamics, very important, and then land degradation, which I'll talk to you about. And, and I think it's probably important to just segue here a little bit and mention what land degradation is. It's, it's defined there, but it's sort of that, that reduction of an ecosystem's capacity to sustainably deliver, they call it ecosystem services. So grazing, field wood. You can even think of clean water and clean air as ecosystem services. So how sustainable as an ecosystem in delivering these services over time, right? And if it degrades in any of these abilities, we sort of say, well, this is probably a degraded system. And it's a big deal in Southern Africa because of climate change, because of drought events, because of um, a lot of the interaction between humans and the system, which I'll talk to you about as well. So where are we located? This is uh, South Africa. And here in the red, you'll see the extent of the Kruger National Park. And now South Africa isn't that, that big. It is a pretty large country, generally speaking, but relative to the US, it's not that big. Um, to put it in context, I think, you know, sort of this diagonal is about 2,300 kilometers, give or take. Um, and this is the Kruger National Park. And obviously you can see that it's a significant piece of real estate shown on the right here, where um, a lot of amazing wildlife is housed. And, uh, and it's also, as I said, very active in in what we call well tourism so this is what it looks like this is this is the environment that you find in that savannah and as a child this was part of my rite of passage this is where we go on holiday pretty frequently and back then we were poor and we didn't have uh, air conditioning in the car so you had to sit in this vehicle and drive through the bush uh, day to day and and look for for game for wildlife see if you can spot the lion the hyena or the rhinos and so on so it was actually an amazing place it's an absolutely phenomenal place to do research so I, I tend to want to just go back there and this is also sort of what it looks like there and you can see some of the typical savannah landscapes african trees etc however the kruger national park is is right adjacent to uh, what, what used to be called in the apartheid time homelands. So back in the 1950s, I believe, the apartheid regime uh, asked a lot of the African folks, well, not asked, but moved a lot of the African folks to homelands uh, distributed across the, the um, uh, South Africa. And there are a few of them that I'll show in a second that are actually right adjacent to the park. So African folks were, were moved there and they had to be self-governing and self-sustaining. But it's, uh, I would sort of say it's actually not too dissimilar from the, the Native American idea of reservations, but it was obviously at a, a very strange and 
um, negative implication given the apartheid connotation. And what you see here are actually exactly the same landscape, ecologically speaking, as some of the pictures that I've showed before, but impacted by human land use, as we are, as we tend to do as humans, right? You'll see agricultural impacts, you'll see fieldwood removal for obvious purposes, you'll see grazing impacts, obviously. So, so there's a, a big disparity between what this landscape in a natural setting should look like and what it looks like now due to human impacts. And so there's a big push to engage with these communities now post-apartheid even on a scientific basis and to, to contribute in, in terms of better management and how to use satellite remote sensing to better manage these regions for a more sustainable ecosystem services delivery. Here's just some more examples of a typical landscape there in, in some of the homeland areas. You can see some of the degradation at the, the top here. And, and obviously this is a farming, a subsistence farming typically environment. So, it becomes an interesting, I think, socioeconomic issue where here I am in South Africa, I'm a scientist and not only am I a scientist, I'm a rich scientist. And not only am I a rich scientist, I'm a white scientist. Now I have to go to, to a community here often managed by chiefs and go and convey my pearls of wisdom about how I think they should manage their landscape. And you can imagine that does not go down very well at all. So. It's there's this big distinction between or, 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 or sort of uh, chasm between the science and the application, I would argue. So what we often do is actually try and convey these concepts in graphical map form, because you can actually map a landscape and show clear, say, woody fieldwood removal versus more sustainable fieldwood removal in a visual way. And these folks know their fields, they know their landscapes. And when they see a visual like that, you, I think you get them on board more with the process of, of sustainable management of environment. Here is another example. We, we look at fire ecology quite a lot. And what you're looking at here on the left and the top and the bottom, you're looking at fire plots. So you'll see this sort of linear feature with certain segments that have been burned and certain segments where you have had fire excluded to sort of evaluate the impact of fire frequency, fire intensity on the landscape dynamics. And fire is a significant management tool in these environments because you often have to burn a field for it to regenerate properly. It typically burns naturally, right? But now because we're changing the environment and interfering with the environment, we often have to induce these fires so that that natural ecosystem a state and decomposition and regrowth can take place. Here's even an old picture from, uh, this is probably the 1960s, 70s, of a typical fire exclusion zone on the right, and then a, a burnt area with a, a fire break in the middle. So you can actually compare and contrast the two impacts, left and right. And it's not necessarily that the left scene is a degraded scene. It could arguably be a natural occurrence of fire, that over time would result in, in this kind of, of environment. So with that being said, what do we have in hand to, to do these kinds of scientific sensing and, 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 and studies? Well, we have the sensors, right, and the airplane, but without the field data, we're actually, we're nowhere. Um, I always joke with my students to say, without field data, we're just making pretty pictures. So we always have to relate what we measure on the field, whether that be woody biomass, tree height, uh, herbaceous or grass biomass, to something we sense from a plane. Because if we can establish that relationship between field data and airborne sensing, now we can map, we can establish a model, for instance, that we can use to map across a landscape and fly an entire Kruger National Park and use these models based on the sensing built upon the field data to actually map a phenomenon across the whole park. As I said, for instance, herbaceous biomass. So we establish plots like these. They're typically pretty large. I would say 50 by 50 meter with 10 meter spacing, where we sample each of these locations for things like grass biomass, woody biomass, water content. How much bare soil do we observe in specific areas? What is, how much litter, tree measurements, et cetera, et cetera. So we, we extract a lot of, I would say, ecological variables. And here you can see some examples where 
Um, the science team is, is actually collecting things like diameters of trees, heights of trees, GPS location of samples, because we remember we want to couple it to the remote sensing. So we have to know for a specific grass biomass sample, where did we collect it and how much biomass was actually present. And then we relate it to the Carnegie Airborne System here. And on the left, you'll see the one is a, a very fancy camera, for lack of a better word. It's called a spectrometer, uh, imaging spectrometer. And it measures hundreds of wavelengths that we can use to analyze the landscape. And the gray box here is actually the LIDAR. So that's the pulsing laser that measures the 3D structure. And here are some examples of the, the, the data. You'll see a true color image. This is the Salby Sand River. Then you'll see that red representation of, of near infrared. You'll see the healthy growing trees because they reflect a lot of near infrared. And then we can generate products like this. This is a product that shows you in, in, in warm colors, higher leaf content and leaf layering and cooler colors, fewer leaves and leaf layering. Bare soil, same. You can sort of see the road here and the river bank. You can sort of map bare soil and often bare soil is, is coupled to degradation. And then finally you take that image and you slice through it and you look at the LIDAR point cloud. And, and this is to me, some of the most beautiful data. You can see the little points describing a tree, a tree canopy, etc. cetera. And here's that example I gave of actual LIDAR data in the Kruger National Park. This top one you can, all, you can see is sort of from a, like a nice profile, you can see the soil or the dirt ground profile. You can see various sizes of trees and crown diameters and undergrowth, etc. cetera. And, and we can write algorithms to actually extract the 3D components and use things like tree height, tree diameter to model the biomass of a tree and map it across a landscape. And that's what I'm sort of showing here. Our ultimate goal is to map an ecologically important metric across a landscape. And in this case, it was biomass, woody biomass. So we process the imagery and then we establish relationships between the, the measured biomass and the image properties so that we can now extract from a laser um, certain properties of the field and relate those to the measured values. Here's just an example. You're looking at a, a laser pulse and it travels through space or time and maybe hits the top of a tree in the top left here maybe some smaller trees, maybe some sub undergrowth and boom, it hits the ground. So that's called a waveform LIDAR. And we can express many, many thousands of waveform LIDARs across or lasers pulses across a landscape like this. And on the left here, you're looking at the intensity of the laser in a 3D box. We call it a voxel, sort of um, a slang for a volumetric pixel. So think of it as a cube. So here you're looking at the intensity of the laser in 3D cube space for a landscape. And you can, again, you can see the trees. You can see the ground and the grass where it's lower. And it's just a beautiful way to look at the landscape in terms of 3D structure. And then, as I said, we use some of these way from LIDAR metrics. We measure field biomass and we establish models to map that biomass across the entire landscape. And here's another example of a potential waveform or a laser that pulsed through a tree canopy. And that's the return you get on the, on the y-axis, I have height above ground. And on the x-axis, I have the intensity or amplitude of the laser. And you can see it's high, oops, high intensity in the top canopy, then maybe some branches right here, some understory right there. And then it gives me a nice big distinct pulse for the ground hit. And I can use that information to relate it to the biomass of that tree. So here's just some examples. I can look up the at the duration of that pulse. So now I look at amplitude on the y-axis, time on the x-axis, and that duration of that laser pulse, and I can map it as tree height across a landscape. Ay -ay -ay. Or I can look at the, that voxelized intensity, so those 3D cubes intensity. So I've got height, I've got pixel area, I can sum it up, and now I've got a volume estimate of how much volume does a, a tree canopy occupy? And I derive a bunch of different metrics from the laser. And then I map things like, as I said, woody biomass. On the right here, I maybe should just mention this. You see that Kruger National Park in yellow. Then you see the Sabi Sands Game Reserve. So that's a, a privately managed game reserve. I don't know why it's jumping like that. It's a privately managed game reserve. And this is the type of place that the Waipaloi go to, to, to go and relax with a 
martini and look at how the lions are hunting. Um, so obviously they change the dynamics of the system as well towards high end tourism. And then in the, in the orange here, you're looking at those, um, one of those um, homelands or sort of communal areas. Long story short, we're actually able to map either for, as a general model across the landscapes or as a communal model focusing on the communal areas with pretty high accuracy, say R squares. So that's sort of an indicative of the accuracy, right? Woody biomass using lasers. And the neat thing is we can now scale it across that entire region. Just another example, we also can map uh, herbaceous or grass biomass. So here you're looking at the, at the scene and the, the warm colors here in kilograms per hectare tells you ex approximately how much grass biomass is present. I don't know, it's some setting I think, but anyway. So why is this important? I can use a map like this and actually relate it to the health of the ecosystem in terms of its grass biomass um, distribution, and maybe a, a degraded area like this, this bright spot right here. I can relate it to, to nutrient cycling and grazing load for, for wild game and animals and even cattle if I, if I wanted to. So now I'm gonna switch gears a little bit and talk to about one of, I think one of the key challenges or problems here, and that's that of field wood removal in an, in an ecosystem like that. And you'll see a host of different folks who participated in this study. So here you see the team, here you see Greg Asner on the left. He's the, the PI of the instrument, uh, came to South Africa, at significant expense to come and fly. This is very, very expensive data that we collect. And here you can see uh, that the team, there's Greg Asner again. Um, that, that actually collected the data. So why, why fuel wood? Now, some of you are from Africa, um, many of you are not, but in a rural community like this, uh, there's a high uh, dependence on fuel wood for, for just, goodness, warming, for cooking, etc. So there's a need of the community, an obvious need to, to, to harvest fuel, i.e. wood. Now, it used to be that, that the wood was readily available at the ground level due to dead trees and, and, and debris, but to a greater extent, people are now forced to harvest from live trees. And they're very careful, I'll show some examples, where they would literally cut a limb from a tree and not just fell an entire tree with the intent of preserving the trees as well. A lot of these trees have a cultural significance to, to the rural people, so they, they don't just want to chop down trees just because. But this is sort of exacerbated by um, a very sticky situation, even in the US, right? And that is of immigration and often illegal immigration, because a lot of times the, the borders in Africa are, in, are sort of um, fluid, if you will. And, and depending on, on political instability or food re resources or requirements, you have a lot of folks moving across borders. And these folks live in the area but you often have um, others who come here illegally and exploit the, the resources like fuel wood for, for money. And they would harvest local fuel wood and go sell it on the market and thereby um, diminishing the, the ability of a, of a local community to manage fuel wood sustainably. So this is a big problem. Here you can see an example of such a tree where you can see specific limbs that have been harvested for, for fuel wood, yet the, the larger tree remains intact to, to survive. So our objective here was really to quantify differences for the Kruger National Park, that fancy game reserve, and then the neighboring communal areas and, and, and see if we can use lasers, LIDAR, to map the differences in, in canopy, in fieldwood for a, let's call it a natural ecosystem on the left to a more fieldwood removed or, or um, human impacted landscape on the right. So this is just one example of such a product from the laser system. You're looking at top-down tree canopies where brighter colors indicate taller trees. And it's hopefully pretty clear to you that you can actually map a landscape in terms of all its, my oh goodness, you can map a landscape in terms of all its tree height distributions. You can even measure canopy widths, heights, uh, density, stem counts, and relate these to to um, woody biomass, woody volume, and fuel root removal. For argument's sake, you could sort of argue that this center section is a pretty intact, smaller savanna forest, whereas over here, there's maybe perhaps been a lot of um, trees removed 
for, for fieldwork purposes. So here's just an example of that sort of land use gradient, we call it, where you have the Kruger National Park on the east, you extend to the western sides through Sabi Sand Game Reserve, and then through to the communal areas. And just relatively speaking, I, you've got Mozambique, Zimbabwe, and South Africa, um, all bordering the Kruger National Park, which makes for very interesting social dynamics. Because you obviously have a lot of influx of folks from Zimbabwe, if you've kept your eye on the news, and maybe from Mozambique, um, actually coming through to South Africa through the park itself. So here's an example of such a data set. On the top right, you can see the, the Carnegie Airborne Observer imagery draped over a 3D point cloud. And it's pretty obvious that you're looking at a landscape like this. A lot of trees have been removed. Now, it's, it's, it's a lot, of, lot to look at on the right, this graph, but you're looking at woody tree, in other words, vegetation, height classes, by specific classes. So this is one to two meters and larger than seven at the top. And you're looking at these classes color coded by where they occur. Are they in fields, rangelands? Are they inside the park, inside Sabi Sand, that fancy game reserve? And the rangeland and fields are all in the communal areas. And now you can actually assess what the tree height distributions at a regional le level would be. And it's, if you look at this, for instance, look at the rangeland here on Gabro, which is a specific substrate. Gabro is, I think, less productive than, than granite. And we'll look at granite in a second. But you can see that there's a, a large number of small, smaller woody trees, seedlings, if you will, one to two meters tall, which is not very tall, but a significantly um, reduced amount at taller trees. So you can sort of make your own assumptions, but that a lot of trees, larger trees have been removed in this Gabro rangeland. Compare that to the fields. Here you actually see conservation of some of the taller trees within the fields. And we found that because of the cultural significance of this, a lot of folks that actually plant fields would maintain the trees and, and try and preserve them that way. So here's a, whoop, look at those arrows. Here's an example of granite. So granite is a more productive um, substrate um, more nu nutrients and so on. And you can sort of see a similar, it's still a rural communal area, um, looks like this, but you can see a little bit more structure, more productivity. You can see the subsistence of some of the trees here. And again, you can look at the distributions by height of woody or tree components. And long story short is you can see a, a slightly different distribution compared to Gabro, where for instance, they could look at the rangeland here. You have a little bit more here and a little bit less here. It's more of an even distribution in terms of the high classes. And if you look at, for instance, um, Kruger National Park, you see uh, uh, also an interesting distribution, a lot of lower trees and some in the mid class, more in the mid class, but also not a lot of tall trees. And, and you start to wonder why. The big answer to that, elephants and to some degree fire. So we'll talk about that as well. Here's just another example. This is actually in the Sabi Sand Game Reserve. So this is now a non-communal area managed for profit, if you will. Um, so it looks more like a typical savanna environment where you can take the tourists to, to do game viewing. So what are some of the conclusions? I've highlighted the, the takeaways in red. Our, our results vary by geology. Granite, more productive, right? But for even for the productive area, there's a 50% reduction in woody cover at, at the smaller tree levels due to land use. And the land use is actually more severe than the impacts of elephants and fire, call it the natural impacts. So there's a definite need to, to develop policies to better manage the woody resource in a sustainable uh, manner. So the large trees are often conserved in, in the rains and in fields. So for, for cultural purposes, some of these trees have medicinal value or even just cultural significance. And the question though becomes is, do these trees or are they able to reproduce um, just by itself you know, in singular fashion? And that's, that's a big issue. And then the, the team also decided, well, there's, there's really a need to look at elephant and fire impacts eventually. Speaking of elephants, uh, Greg Asner gave an amazing TED talk. If you go on YouTube and you let, and I put the link down here and you just Google Asner TED talk, you'll see the talk. It's a, actually a fascinating talk. And I grabbed these uh, screenshots from that talk, but on the left, you actually see in the foreground, 
an elephant inclusion area. So this is what they call a fence line contrast study. The fence running right over here. So here's a big fence that excludes the elephants from the rear side of the, the image, the background, but allow ele elephants in the, in the front um, inclusion zone. And you can just see the significant impact of elephants on an ecosystem. They're, they can be pretty destructive. Then the neat thing is, I can collect data throughout the years, I being a scientist, not me specifically. Um, so Greg Asner did this. He actually collected during multiple revisits to this site. And now you can plot and map in red trees that have been impacted by elephant um, interactions. You can see a, a change in the structure of these trees measured through a laser from air to, to sort of map the, the impact of elephants across a landscape, which I think is pretty fascinating. I'm sort of close to wrapping up here. I just quickly want to talk about land degradation. It's a big deal, right? Um, on the top right, you see here a typical map we can generate from remote sensing satellite products. This is something called rain use efficiency. So the trend in vegetation production per unit rainfall. So obviously you'd like vegetation to be able to um, absorb, assimilate rainfall and photosynthetic energy and nutrients and be productive. But here you sort of see a change in rain use efficiency. In other words, a change in the plant's ability to be productive. And Kruger National Park is up here and you can see hotspots in South Africa where plants or ecosystems are losing their ability to remain productive. So this is a, a very nice visual, I think, to sort of map land degradation. And you can see it here on the lower left as well. So there's a dire need to map this. And we do this using satellite products. We can map the, the start of the growing season in Southern Africa using satellite pro products. We can map the standard deviation of the start. In other words, when is the growth season start in a specific location? And how variable is that across time? So if I, you can imagine, if I wanna farm corn, where do you think I'd like to be? I'd like to be in a, an area like this, where the start is ideal for, for, for vegetation growth, but it's also um, homogeneous, it's consistent. It's not a lot of variability in the start date. So we can use products like this to map how ecosystems are changing through time in terms of, of its productivity. So that's a big topic in Southern Africa. So I have, I think, three more slides or four more slides. And so what's next for RIT? So it's been a while, to be honest with you, since I've had a, a sustained pro project in South Africa. But NASA recently awarded us a project in, in its Bioscape um, uh, program. So you can see some of the, the head honchos in this program, NASA, University at Buffalo, um, South African National Parks, and then South Africa's National Research Foundation, as well as SION, uh, Environmental Observation Network. So these folks came together and identified uh, a very unique, ecologically important region in South Africa. And they scoped a study previously and presented to NASA a suggestion for a future proposal call, to which I responded, amongst others. Um, and we were awarded the project to go study this specific area. Where is it located? It's called the Cape Floristic region. It's, uh, it's called Feinbos. Feinbos is Afrikaans for fine bush. Some of you might uh, drink um, rooibos tea, red bush tea, and it has these articulated little leaves. So that's a typical type of fine bush or Feinbos um, plant. And here you can see some other examples in, in this image of Feinbos and Feinbos type ecosystems. It's a very genetically biodiverse area, but it's also heavily impacted by fire, um, climate change, etc. cetera. So the, so the science question the NASA team came up with were things like related to the distribution of the biodiversity, ecosystem func functions, and, and also feedbacks. And because we're in imaging science, we, we, I'm not an ecologist. So a lot of these questions I know very little about. I know why they want to do them, but I'm not the expert on these, in these questions. But they need, as I said, this landscape sensing ability that imaging science and remote sensing provides. So what did we propose to do? NASA is going to fly some of their top of the line sensors. Everest is a hyperspectral sensor. It collects from the blue through the shortwave infrared, I think, um, around 400 different color channels. They're also going to um, 
collect thermal energy, thermal sensing to, to look at thermal dynamics, fires, and et cetera. And then finally, also that laser, LIDAR that I spoke about, they're also gonna fly what's called ELVIS. They always come up with these unique acronyms. It's a laser altimeter for vegetation studies. So they're taking some of the best sensors that you possibly can lay your hands on to this area to go fly. However, we said, we want to build cartoons of this uh, uh, ecosystem. On the right here, you're actually looking at a virtual scene. This is not a real scene of the Harvard Forest, an area in Harvard Forest in Massachusetts. It's one example of such a virtual scene that we've developed. And you might ask why? If I can build such a scene and I can make it true to life, in other words, physically speaking, it absorbs, reflects, transmits energy as the trees out there would do, then I can start simulating things. I can say, if I have a light, LiDAR sensor, a laser that flies in this configuration, pulses at this wavelength, will I be able to better extract tree height, biomass, et cetera? So we, we visualize things virtually and then do analytical algorithm development based on those virtual signals as long as my scene is representative of, of reality. That's the key thing. Here are another example. We plan to go to the Feinbos area and collect in situ field data as well as what's called terrestrial laser scanning. Here you see an example of a 3D point cloud of a forest and you can just see the detail in that point cloud. So we can actually reconstruct that forest in 3D. So we plan to take our lasers and go measure the Feinbos. And then here's an example of a cornfield that we developed virtually. We can then build vegetation examples that are true to structure and true to light, if you will, true to reflectance, absorption, transmission and instantiate cornfields. This is a virtual cornfield that we use actually to determine what is the best sensor for assessing corn yield globally. Now we wanna apply the same thinking to the Feinbos region. We wanna develop virtual scenes uh, with the biodiversity, spectral diversity, structural diversity embedded in them and say, what is the ideal sensor to actually assess biodiversity in a system like that? So that's, that's sort of the projects I'm going to keep my summary very short. I think there's such exciting hard science to do in Africa, exceptionally um, challenging, interesting questions. And there are exceptional scientists at, at, in Africa. And I think this is an important point to realize. There are also very complex socioeconomic problems, both in terms of the science question. In other words, how can we use science to drive policy and inform policy, but also in the execution. Um, case in point, in, in, in Southern Africa, and I cannot speak for the rest of Africa and a lot of the rural communities, the men are the lazy bums, and I'm being funny, light, but they, they manage and rule, and the women do the hard work. So you engage with a community like this, and you engage with the men, because they're the decision makers, so to speak. They then get up and tell the women how to do things and implement things. They're the hard workers. Things are changing, don't get me wrong. Even in a, in a and I would say in a, a rural community setting in Africa, things are changing as, as time rolls along, right? Um, but there is this, this aspect that I think we as Westerners have to realize. It's, it's not our place often to go and tell people how they should manage their own systems. I think we have to engage very carefully, and very um, sensitively with these communities because we are visiting them and they live there and they manage their area. And I think how to communicate there is still a, a challenging question. So that's what I mean by science execution. And then finally, my two cents is collaborate, um, find those scientists that, that you can collaborate with, invite, get them here, help them being trained up in new techniques, but very importantly, go learn from them as well. I've, I've been on the receiving end of this as well while being a scientist in, in Africa where uh, scientists from the US or Europe would roll along and act like a, a knight on a white horse. You know, we're here to solve your problems. And, and I think it's, it's often a, a challenge and an issue that we need to address. The folks in Africa know a lot about their system, more than you and I will ever do. And my first point, there are excellent scientists there to work with and solve some of these problems. So I think we should be careful in how we approach that and really approach it from a reciprocal perspective, not that, that we as, as US citizens or sorry, scientists or, or European scientists 
and then you can add the complexity of race in there as well. Let's, um, that's the, the, the elephant in the room, right? But you can add that complexity there as well. That we don't act as, as know-it-alls and saviors to the, the challenge, but rather engage on an, on an honest, open discussion and a reciprocal learning environment. And I think that's very important. Anyway, I hope you understand what I mean by that. Um, and I just want to acknowledge a lot of the folks who contributed to this uh, in terms of study and content and so on. Uh, I worked with a lot of these in the Council of Scientific and Industrial Research many years ago. Some of them have gone on to very high positions um, and, and so on. And, and, and as I said, they're there. They're very keen to engage in science. And, and I think it's just up to us to, to approach that properly. Anyway, I'll, I'll, stop, I'll stop there. I don't know if there are any questions. Thank you so much, Jan. It was really wonderful and, um, and interested. I know I have a number of questions rolling through my head, but I will open it up to see if um, if any of our attendees do. We do have a quest, um, a comment there for you a little bit and question um, from James Clark from uh, the Walton Institute at WIT, who is one of our, our partners. So nice to see you, James. Thanks for connecting. And um, he'd be interested in working together, but also thoughts about how to engage EU-based researchers, maybe a little bit in connection with what you were just saying and, uh, or more broadly. Yeah, I think that's a very good question. Uh, thanks, James. I, I think that the biggest challenge uh, that you probably experienced and that we experienced as well is, is that of funding. Uh, if we get an NSF award, it has to be for local uh, salary um, education. So it's often, difficult to find that that uh, call it reciprocal reciprocal funding where where you have either a local institution in, in, in south in, in africa that's willing to also pitch in money and fund their side of the science now with this specific project we've been very lucky the national research foundation in south africa has actually launched a proposal call for reciprocal funding in africa to to support the nasa initiative and I think that that is a great start to, to really build a relationship and joint research and papers and so on and outputs. It, it's, it's one of those things where I think um, programs like Fulbright and maybe other such programs could, could really be useful too, is if we can, uh, and not just to the US or to Europe, but also from Europe to Africa, share scientists, even on a short-term basis, three months, six months, and not necessarily two or three years, but have folks engage reciprocally uh, across the water, so to speak. But it's challenging, I'll be honest. For me, it's really been challenging because mainly, mainly because of the, the funding limitations. I don't know what the, the European Union funding is like in terms of, of reciprocal funding and so on. Yeah, I'll definitely reach out to you. I see your comments in the, in the chat here. I'll, I'll definitely reach out to you afterwards because I'm always looking for for um, collaborators as well you know um, it's a lot to do <laughs> wonderful thank you so much James and I, I love to see the the partnership collaboration coming out of uh, these kinds of talks too are there any other questions oh. again you can um, feel free to use the hand raise tool I have uh, given access uh, to our attendees to use your microphones if you uh, would like to do so as well. One, while we're reading here, one question I had, I'm really interested, uh, Jan, my, my background more in, in the policy area and, um, and really that, that citizen engagement in decision-making uh, level. And I'm curious too, I, I know you, you talked to sort of the, the balance of working with these big organizations, institutions, NASA, government organizations and such too. And, and how do you, you manage and, and, and balance um, working with them, gathering good information, kind of that top down, and then also engaging at that citizen level and, and bottom up, if you will? Uh, it's a very good question, Lindsay. I, I, I honestly don't know. I think, yeah. I think as I, I'm now in, in mid, mid or later stage of career, and I, I think I've, an, I've had an epiphany that it's not about publishing papers that sit on a shelf. Yeah. It's about getting things that people can use in their hands, you know. And, and so I do a lot of work now on precision agriculture because I want to contribute in some minor way even to, to sustainable agriculture and, and improve productivity in agriculture. I think in this context that we just discussed, it's 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 a thing I, I said it's a question that I truly don't have the answer to. 
because there are a lot of sensitivities, as I, as I mentioned, mm -hmm. but there are also an amazing set of African scientists coming to the fore right. who understand both sides of the coin. And I think that's gonna be essential that, that we cross that, that communication bar barrier by, by educating more folks in Africa Absolutely. and having them educate us on, on things, what to do and not to do in terms of engaging the community. And, and take their lead, to be honest. I mean, it's I'm going to their house, so I'll take their lead in terms of how to engage with that community. But I think visuals are really important. You know, um, these are farmers that know their cattle and they know their crops. So showing them visuals of distributions across the landscape, things like that are often very useful because, because it's, it's, it is arguably a way that they've never been able to look at their property or their farm, you know, their community. Yeah. So I think that's very important. That makes sense. Do you do you feel that as though as the science as the African based scientists are growing in, in number and expertise, are they also focused on building trust and relationships in, in the communities too? That's a good question. I don't know. I, I've been out of South Africa for so long. Um, yeah. my my immediate response is I think so. Um, but I don't have any hard evidence to back that up. It's, it's, it's a very uh, family-oriented culture. So I can only imagine that, that even the pretty well-established, uh, high-profile scientists, African scientists in South Africa, still go to back to their communities quite frequently. It's, it's part of their culture, right? And so I, I'm, I'm sort of thinking, yes, I, I'm sure that, that, there, that there's sort of a communication is happening. Um, at what level? I'm not sure because right. you do need sure. it to happen, like you said, maybe more at a policy level as well with the the, um, the community. Higher, yeah, even even know. building trust in the institutions to what to the level they're able to things like that. It's really interesting. Thank you. Like I say, my mind is is going. Thank you so much for the presentation and um, and sharing your work. Any other final questions before we switch over? Great. Well, thank you once again, Jan. I really appreciate it. And I will be sharing um, out the recording afterwards too for anybody um, who was not uh, able to, to join us today online and um, or would like to refer back to it later. So thank you again. And with that, let me switch over and welcome, uh, sorry, Joy and Eladia to begin your presentation and I apologize I'm unsuccessfully multitasking here so Joy would you like to begin yes should I go ahead and share my screen yeah please hopefully you have okay. access that it works well yes so hopefully everyone can see that um thank you yes. so much for joining us and thank you also to Lindsay out of RIT global office for putting together this fantastic colloquium. I think this is the first of its kind, um, RIT in Africa. And so I think it's great that um, this setting explores what many different facets of RIT research community is, is doing in and within the continent of Africa. So excited to be here. Um, I'm joined by my friend and colleague, Dr. Elieta Griffinell um, from Robert Morris University. And I'm Joy Labuti from the Sonos College of Business here at RIT. And we're gonna be presenting um, just different takes on entrepreneurship practices in Africa. So this is actually a good opportunity for us to take a step back and look at our research agenda. We've been doing research on entrepreneurship for um, several years now. And this gives us a good chance to sort of see how our different projects sort of comes together in the overall context of where entrepreneurship is heading within the continent is rapidly moving. We'll talk about that a little bit in an overview of entrepreneurship in Africa, but also some emerging trends and opportunities. So with that, um, our agenda today is just to provide a bit of an overview of entrepreneurship in Africa. Um, as I said earlier on, um, many of you who are joining us will probably know that Africa is a hotbed for much, a lot of research activity, including entrepreneurship. Um, so we'll talk a bit about that, and then we'll highlight some of our relevant research projects in this domain. Um, and then we will look at some of the emerging trends and future opportunities for research um, in, in Africa within the entrepreneurship context. And so just to provide a bit of overview on entrepreneurship in Africa, um, the African continent has been experiencing tremendous growth in recent years. 
Um, and yeah. please feel free to interrupt as we're presenting. It's, it's a pretty much a dialogue, um, so feel free to interrupt. But they've been experiencing a lot of growth in recent years. Um, we'll, you see that numerous growing economies within the continent Af of Africa has been, um, has been seen a lot of advancements. And although regional differences may exist within Africa, collectively speaking, we see that the primary drivers of growth have been emerging consumer markets, um, a lot of regional economic integration, investments in infrastructure, rapid technological advancements, which we'll talk about um, over the course of this presentation, as well as more and more newer markets opening in the service sector. So more service orientation um, is, is being placed within the continent. We also see that there is some increasing foreign direct investments. Um, according to the China Africa Research Initiative, uh, China recently extended 150 US billion dollars to African governments through loans and through some company funding between, over the last 20 years, between 2000 and 2020. Um, and this has essentially become the benchmark for FDI within the continent. The European Union recently announced just a couple of months ago um, a $170 billion investment for projects and development within the continent of Africa as well. And then Biden, as part of his, uh, one of his um, economic or uh, environmental initiatives has also recently announced $40 trillion within developing nations, including Africa on climate, health and security issues by 2035. So we see that globally, there's a lot of interest in the continent and in improving its economic um, well-being. We also see that um, as part of this trend, uh, there are numerous young entrepreneurs within the informal sector that are oftentimes not captured in GDP reports. Um, so there are several nonprofit startups that are exist to support these organizations. Um, one is actually owned by a friend of mine, Bayi Foundation, that targets youth entrepreneurs and also encourages uh, job creation for these entrepreneurs. These younger entrepreneurs uh, around this age group of 18 to 30 are eager, they're driven, they're tech savvy. Um, they're very connected with what's going on within the continent, but also globally as well, thanks to social media. And they are really shifting what has been normalized as the traditional entrepreneur. Um, we also see that technology, as I just spoke earlier on, has played a role, not just with the younger generation, but also um, in a lot of sort of user-centered platforms. So as many of you may know, technology is oftentimes acknowledged as one of the primary drivers of globalization. And we're seeing that um, with the focus of these platforms. Uh, technology, the internet is becoming a lot more accessible to individuals across different income strata. So it's not necessarily that you have to be of a certain um, wealth or income level to have access to technology. We're now seeing this occur across um, different income levels. So we have e-transfer platforms that allow people to pay as you go. Um, pay as you go phones that are common in the States now were much more common in Africa before they were even here. So the idea of you know, phone plans or monthly payments didn't really work for the vast majority of this population. Um, and then we also see the rise of immigrant entrepreneurship, which we'll spend some more time talking about today in our, our project. Um, immigrant entrepreneurship essentially is where Africans are seeking opportunities, both in other African nations, but also outside the continent, um, while still intending to support the local economy. And we'll talk some more about the challenges of this later on that may exist, um, generally speaking, but as one can imagine with immigrant entrepreneurship, there are some challenges. There's you know, regulation that restricts their ability to acquire assets. There's a lot of exclusionary labor policies. Um, that, that exists, but despite this, we see an increase in Africans desiring to explore opportunities elsewhere. Um, and then um, academically, there's also an increase in the focus on entrepreneurship within research, right? So while this is going on in real time, research is sort of saying, okay, we wanna better study what's happening in entrepreneurship. And entrepreneurship, like many other general management areas, um, may have been primarily or initially explored in more westernized markets, but we've seen a lot of significant progress made in globalizing its reach, being more inclusive and exploring organizations in non-Western developing economies. Um, there are oftentimes several call for papers, research inquiries, 
into domains of economic inequality, into domains of constrained resources. And so um, we see that the research is also interested in um, entrepreneurship and management practices, generally speaking, in Africa. So in the midst of this interest, there are numerous challenges. Um, uh, one key challenge is this idea of the uncertainty and complexity of African societies. And so Jan also mentioned this one in his talk, and I think it's interesting because Jan spoke a lot about the South African context, and that's the primary context that we'll be talking about in two of our research projects. Um, and he also talked about land degradation, which we'll talk about in our third project. So it almost seems like, I don't know if Lindsay planned it out, but it seems like this was a very synergistic uh, set of talks for today. Um, but one of the things that he mentioned and alluded to was this exact uncertainty and complexity. Um, in many areas within the African continents, you're dealing with these dualities of, you know, modern advancement, but also archaic traditional mindsets. And he talked about some of the more entrenched, maybe masculine mindsets that exist that could impede um, advancement in, in management, in entrepreneurship. Um, institutional voids, you know, there may be some absence of market supporting institutions that would help enable entrepreneurship, um, you know, across the continent that, that may, that might not exist in maybe more advanced um, societies. And um, this idea of what characterizes organizational effectiveness. So again, more advanced economies have established these measures, things like performance outcomes, competitive out advantage, all these things that are in the domain of organizational effectiveness that might not be the primary motive for entrepreneurs in these markets um, with maybe more of a, a potentially necessity-based approach towards entrepreneurship. And then um, also a lot of infrastructural factors that many people might be aware of with the continent. Um, we know that agriculture is a big part of Africa's economy, but when a lot of, you know, a large percentage of the soil is not arable, when there's water scarcity, when there's global warming, where the big part of the continent um, is centered around the equator, then a lot of these um, environmental challenges and infrastructural challenges can also pose to be a hindrance um, in looking at entrepreneurship in Africa. So we talked a bit about some of the, the steps we see towards advancement in entrepreneurship, but also some of the challenges that, that are, are lay ahead as well. And so um, moving on to our research projects, I'm going to talk, to talk about how our research fits within this overarching overview of entrepreneurship. Um, we've kind of looked at how our research falls within themes. And most of these projects that I'm listing here, I've actually collaborated on with, with uh, Dr. Griffinell. Um, so some of the themes that we've seen our research fall under is three main categories. So one is entrepreneurial agency. And this idea is of agencies, more or less how an entrepreneur's actions affects their surroundings, how what they do affects the, the societies, the community, the resources that they're able to obtain to, to execute their enterprises, but also vice versa, right? The effect that, so the top-down effect that the society or the community has on the entrepreneur and how this might evolve over time and the symbiotic relationship between these two. So agency, um, is a, a one theme that we observe. Another is this idea of conceptualizing the diasporic entrepreneur. Um, so this ideology focuses on the fact that, you know, the resources that entrepreneurs utilize are based on their experiences from multiple domains. And many times entrepreneurs are not just from, a, you know, are not just drawing on their experiences from one domain that they currently exist in, or maybe their home country where they're originally from, but maybe multiple domains that they've existed in during the duration of their, their existence that they draw upon to execute their enterprises. And so just conceptualizing what diaspora means for the African entrepreneur. And then finally, um, there's also a sustainability piece as well, uh, if, if, uh, relevant to a study that we're currently working on. Um, so, you know, with sustainability, unlike maybe more advanced economies where sustainability efforts and research are really embedded into society, as you may imagine, this is not really the case for most of Africa. Um, so this also presents an opportunity to explore more um, you know, research or entrepreneurial practices that can help address some of the sustainability or lack of sustainability focus. Um, and it's an opportunity for more exploration. So there was an earlier talk this week in the colloquium that actually focused on groundwater fed irrigation. So again, we're seeing more research being placed in this domain of, of sustainability. 
And so um, we're gonna spend some more time talking about these three uh, talks that I've highlighted here. The other two are available on Google Scholar. <laughs> um, the stakeholder transformation process also looks at entrepreneurial agency. Um, it looks at um, the, the context there was the Maasai indigenous community from East Africa, where we were examining um, the factors that motivated the stakeholder transformation process of this indigenous community from a non-stakeholder that was lacking in power and legitimacy to being a primary stakeholder of a farm. Um, and so that, that's one that we're not gonna go into detail today. And then um, the other, which falls under the diasporic conceptualization theme, um, it's another study that I did with Eliada, and that looks at, it's a, it's a theory paper that, again, theorizes this idea of the African diaspora venture creation. And that was published in the Journal of African Business. Um, but we're going to go into the three that I've, I've bolded there. So um, I'll transition it to Eliada, who's going to talk more about our first paper, um, Breaking Boundaries. Great. Thank you so much, Joy. Um, and I echo my colleagues' words in saying thank you so much for having us here and kudos on such a meaningful colloquium. Um, this research is really important to us, both of us personally, um, a, a personal part of our background is that we are both of African descent, both Ni uh, Nigerian specifically, um, and hence then the immigrant narrative and more specifically the immigrant entrepreneurs uh, narrative has been um, has been close to, to, to the heart. And so at the time when we were conduct conducting this initial study, which is, has kind of served as, as a foundational uh, piece of work from which a lot of our then subsequent studies have, have drawn a sense of grounding, um, I, was a, a, um, I was a senior lecturer of social entrepreneurship at the University of Cape Town's Graduate School of, of Business. Um, and I was the academic lead of the Bursa Center for uh, social innovation and entrepreneurship. And so now being positioned across uh, uh, borders <laughs> enabled us to be able to collect data um, uh, right there with a, with a very special inroads into the South African entrepreneurial community. Um, and uh, it also gave us a great uh, research flow as when I, I was asleep, Joy was awake. <laughs> and so we were able to get a lot done. Um, but this initial paper uh, really focuses on the role of immigrant entrepreneurs within a, a host country. And what is unique and a little bit uh, gripping about this paper is that it was accepted into the Journal of Management Studies special issue on um, economic inequality and the, and the implications that has on a society. And what we were realizing contextually within South Africa and, and within particular regions of South Africa at the time is that um, as there was such a stark um, economic disparity, particularly within individuals across racial groups, um, but then also between individuals across residential domains. So whether or not you lived in the city versus if you lived in the township or the urban areas, you're seeing this really big gap in terms of the resources you're able to access, your quality of life, the longevity of your employment, so on and so forth. And for a part of the population that was struggling most to that economic depravity, you were seeing uh, they were predominantly Black South African at the time, and you were seeing um, resentment being fueled against other African foreign nationals. And so within this context, we are watching African immigrants from other African countries take residence in South Africa, um, knowing that there is a potential of facing or encountering that tension, and yet choosing to build businesses that um, were not necessarily embedded to a particular economic uh, a cultural enclave, or they were not um, defined only by their nationality or by a, a market, a shared culture. They were trying to build businesses that would serve broad and diverse markets. And so that is what compelled us to start uh, this study. We were asking ourselves, how are immigrant entrepreneurs knowing that they're confronting this tension because of the social depravity which economic disparity is causing for the predominantly black population in South Africa, how are they using their home and host institutions, the institutions and the knowledge and, and all that from their uh, country of origin 
as well as the um, uh, resources within their the country that they're residing in to create market activity that is not enclave, it's not isolated, it's actually intersective. And hence then they're able to build ventures that have some sort of sustainability and have some sort of uh, prob uh, probability and lasting longer than a particular trend or growing beyond a, a, a very specific market. And so in order to study this, we use a structuration theory uh, as you'll notice, a big pattern in our research is that we like to um, look at the interaction between economic and sociological variables. Um, most of our study is qualitative, those who are looking at the, tr the, the trends between these concepts of econo from um, economic sciences as well as sociological behavior to kind of understand how human how, how the behavior, the socialized behavior of human beings informs economic um, um, output. And here particularly, we're looking at entrepreneurship. And structuration theory, uh, well established and grounded in the 90s, particularly uh, by Giddens, but then with generations of scholars afterwards, really tries to emphasize this interdependent relationship between the agent, the actor, the person, the one who is enacting the action, and the environment that they're embedded in. Um, kind of a, a critique and a push against the idea that we're either fully socialized creatures who then must um, react and perform as guided and restricted by our environment, but then also pushing against the idea that we're fully independent, um, unlinked creatures who are able to do as we please. Rather, there's a symbiotic nature here between our agency our will and our ability to act on that will, and then our social structure, the integrated environment of, of both norms and stakeholders and uh, normalized activities that we are often embedded in. So using the structuration theory, we wanted to understand how immigrant entrepreneurs in South Africa were navigating their host country, um, um, taking into account this economically uh, unequal environment um, and what they were drawing from their host country as well, the prevalence or the relevance of their host of their of their home country in that process. And so this was a study that um, it engaged us for several years. It was a longitudinal study that we carried out over uh, three years with um, very concentrated, immersive data collection at both ends of those years. We featured a very close up examination of eight uh, African immigrants from a variety of countries spanning from Nigeria to Zimbabwe to Zambia. Um, and we were all, we were able to just allow ourselves to be fully immersed within their working environment, their entrepreneurial environment, and then also their living in, their, their living context with regards to how South Africa was shifting. Um, several of you may have followed the news that where the media was capturing what was termed as xenophobic attacks. And so these were violence that were targeted against African foreign nationals. At one point there was a rise in 2008, and then again, um, when my family and I lived there in 2015, and then again in 2018. And so we were seeing a bit of this pattern that was um, that was uh, ravaging a country at a time where, uh, where it at the same time was showing great potential of growth, innovative capabilities, so on and so forth. So through an in-depth examination uh, using grounded theory, true to the nature of that methodological approach. We welcome the research to speak to us. And one a few of the things that we were able to emphasize in our findings was that the host and home, uh, host and home countries are indeed uh, both at play in the venture building process of the immigrant entrepreneur in their host country, that they are um, increasingly becoming aware and many a times, sometimes even embracing some of the cultural, cultural norms and some of the institutional structures that they are operating within. But then they do still face the challenges of being otherized, of being excluded. And when that is the case, then they draw from the, the, the tacit knowledge and the 
uh, cognitive know-how of their home country. And in doing so, it enables them to move, to navigate their host country terrain in a unique way, oftentimes guided by different norms and different insights that has been cultivated by their home country upbringing that is not of norm in their host country. Hence then they identify opportunities differently. They see relationships, uh, potential relationships differently. Whereas in the host country, there may be a certain group of people either because of class or race that local entrepreneurs would not engage with. Immigrant entrepreneurs come with a different lens because that lens is not shaped fully by the host country norms. And so they're in doing so, they're able to navigate this position of exclusion towards intrusion, where now they're starting to break through some of these barriers um, as they're building their ventures to then integration, to then continually build their ventures to be embedded within the local economy, but in a way that is now um, where they're using their innovation and they're creating new networks that are bringing new people and new types of resources together in novel ways. All right, thank you, Eliada. So, um, so th that was a study that we that really explored sort of market activity and integration um, across different sectors and different enclaves, in creating opportunity across different enclaves. In doing that study, we we were still very interested in digging more deeply into this foreign context that they were in, how they were able to still thrive within this penurious, um, challenging environment in the face of some of the oppression that they were facing. And so we wanted to, uh, our second study that we're looking at, um, resources at hand, head and heart, talks about um, this heightened habitus, this increased dependence on home. So the first paper, we, we saw that home matters, but we thought there was more there. How did home matter? And to what extent were they able to draw from the home countries, um, nuances, norms, sense making, to enable them to thrive in the face of this uh, oppressive environment. Um, and so, you know, the first people focused more on creating markets. The second people, we, we wanted to say, okay, there's something else here. And our reviewers told us, some, so is that, they said, because initially we were trying to put everything in one paper and they're like, this is too much. Focus on the market piece of it. And maybe you can focus on this sort of home piece of it in another paper, which we did and which is actually currently impressed in Entrepreneurship Research Journal. Um, and so as Eliana mentioned er early on, um, the xenophobic attacks were real in South Africa just a decade ago. Um, and we noticed that this context provided this layer to understand some of the challenges that immigrant entrepreneurs may face. Um, as you all know, South Africa is oftentimes seen as one of the more prominent emerging economies in the past couple of decades. In the face of that, and it's one reason why many people are trying to immigrate to South Africa from other African countries because of the opportunities there, but the country has seen some, some attacks. Um, 2008, 2015, 2018, a lot of local South Africans targeted and killed African foreign nationals that were living in some of the poor urban communities. They also attacked some foreign owned businesses in Johannesburg um, and they were driven by this accusation that many of these individuals coming from other African countries were coming there to steal their jobs, were coming there to steal wealth that rightfully belongs to them as South African locals, so they felt. So in addition to dealing with some of the resources that were constrained by a lot of the institutional restrictions, these African foreigners, foreign nationals are also having to deal with the added cost of nationalistic sentiments and bias against foreigners, um, which makes it even more challenging to assess, to access resources um, and threatens their overall, overall welfare and safety. And so some of the visuals here shows, um, again, even this, this is from 2020, so a couple of years ago, um, just how much hatred and how visible it was uh, for many of the, the African foreign nationals. Um, so not just, foreign nationals, but also entrepreneurs were, were faced some of this oppression. Um, you, you see the visual here highlights two foreign business owners whose uh, businesses were attacked. One shop was looted, the others um, had a, a, a car dealership and woke up the morning and he, all his cars were, were burned um, because he was actually a Nigerian. It's, it's funny, one of my friends 
who is from Zimbabwe was telling me, and who just came from South Africa a couple months ago, was still speaking to how uh, tense the environment is in South Africa for, um, especially Nigerians, because Nigerians are really viewed as, as um, viewed as people who are attacking the opportunities and taking away opportunities for the local, local South Africans. So she was joking with me that, you know, this isn't a good time for you to go to South Africa right now because of um, some of what's going on there. Um, and again, although some of these recent studies have talked about how immigrant-owned businesses are creating jobs for local South Africans, like the study that we just we, we did in 2018, um, we see some of the challenges that they're having to face. And so we're going to explore this in more deeply. Um, and so a question for this study um, of this paper that's in press is, you know, how do immigrant entrepreneurs try to mobilize resources when the social and also the institutional context of the host country is hostile and actually can prevent them from the eventual creation process? Um, we've seen that there's a growing sentiment of nationalism, as we talked about with in South Africa. Um, and also in other advanced societies. So this is not just South Africa, but we've seen this idea of nationalism, um, even here in the US, many would, would, would argue. And that this anti-foreigner prejudice is becoming common across global regions. And so the relevancy here is that doesn't apply just to South Africa, but to many global regions where we see this phenomenon occurring. And so um, some of the observations in our study is that there's a lot of literature that explores resource mobilization of entrepreneurs. And it talks about the context and the situation as being very prominent in helping them to identify what inputs they are needed for the activity. Um, and so also exploring how this contextual environment, especially when it's penurious, um, was, of, was of a motivation for us. And then um, again, that's piece of the second bullet point there. And then finally, few studies in, um, in literature has actually examined immigrant entrepreneurship within a hostile environment um, that makes it hard for them to access their resources. And so, um, so again, this, this sort of speaks to the motivation behind our study. Some of the theories that we use to explore this more deeply, um, Bordeaux's theory of practice. So Bordeaux um, introduced this framework to articulate resource mobilization of immigrant entrepreneurs. Um, and in doing so, tries to capture why we do this. So it's because we're trying to capture um, the immigrant entrepreneurs, inter, immigrant entrepreneurs' cognitive and adaptive attributes that help to inform their upbringing, their experiences within their home country. So essentially, what th this theory is saying is um, there are three main concepts that are interacting: habitus, which is a well-cited concept, and habitus essentially describes the body's internalization of the social order. Um, so what, to what sense does one, how does one make sense of where they are right now? Are there some prevailing norms, some attitudes, some rules um, by the individual person that's reflected in their decisions, their routines, their languages? And you can imagine that habitus would be strongly tied to one's home country of origin. Um, even though one has lived in a home country for a while, once they immigrate somewhere else, they're so joined from and making sense of their current world based on these decisions and attitudes and ideologies that were ingrained in them from their home country. So that's the idea of habitus. Um, capital is the second concept of Bordeaux's theory of practice. And capital essentially refers to what exactly it is, resources, economic resources, social, symbolic, cultural, all of these resources that helps a person to manage um, and overcome obstacles or take advantage of opportunities. And so, you know, one social structure will be part of this capital. Um, combinations of different types of capital can give value to their social structure. So that's the idea of capital. And then the social field is this domain of relationships, um, positioning, how people can gain access and, and gain power through their social structure. Um, and so basically, who are they interacting with? That's the social field. And so we felt that these three contexts, uh, or these, these three components of Bordeaux's theory of practice, habitus, the sense-making, capital, the resources, and then the social field, the relationships, 
were very relevant in helping us really explore and understand this um, context of South Africa. The other theory that was very relevant to us here is liability of foreigners. Um, liability of foreigners is a theory that was introduced by Sahir in the mid 90s and was originally thought of as the cost, it, it's, it's, it's a firm level theory, not necessarily an entrepreneurial level theory, but it's the cost at which multinational firms incur when they're doing business, doing business in another country that local firms will not incur. So if uh, a firm is going to go do business in a, in a global country or in another country, they'd have to sort of become more familiar with how business is being done there, right? And some of these challenges that they're having to face is a liability. So hence the liability of foreigners, which you'll see abbreviated as LOF. And so we thought that concept was relevant here because um, as immigrant entrepreneurs who are going to other countries, there's also that liability of foreigners, right? Um, and we conceptualize it as economic disparity, maybe income inequality that's situated within the social field. And so we, and we'll talk, talk about it later on, but while it can be seen as a liability, we actually very interestingly were able to sort of spin it and, and visualize it and theorize it as maybe a benefit that they weren't so entrenched in the way things were done in the, home, in the host country because they could sort of draw from the home country habitus or heightened habitus as we called it to, to thrive um, or to survive within this um, penurious environment. And so the last theory is bricolage. Um, so the idea of bricolage was introduced by Baker and Nelson um, it's essentially the sense of how do you make do with resources at hand? How do you um, satisfy? How do you use what you have at hand to create new resources through unconventional methods? Okay, so it looks at more of the creative generation of resources that are in the environment. Um, and given the, the economy, the African economy and the lower income economy, Bricklogs is a very common construct that's explored in this environment because you are having to make do with less. Um, and, and so we look and, and, and generate resources. And so we look at this resource generation process that our immigrant entrepreneurs had to utilize within this um, penurious environment in South Africa, this hostile environment. And so this is the diagram that depicts our proposed conceptual extension over those theory of practice. Um, the diagram shows this idea of, of heightened habitus. So you'll, so you'll see our, our first two propositions, one A and B, lead to this heightened habitus. I describe habitus as a, sort of a sense making, right? And so we 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 felt like, yeah, there was a sense making that was occurring, but we felt like it was even it was even deeper. Um, there's two types of sort of home drawn nuances what we termed as resources at heart, adaptive disposition. So when you're having to live in a host country, especially a host country that's hostile, there's this um, resilience, perseverance, and sort of this attitude. And we call that your resources at heart, sort of this gut heart, I can do this in spite of opposition that many of our, our, our immigrant entrepreneurs had to draw from. So we call that resources at heart and adaptive disposition. Then there's the cognitive disposition, which you call resources at head. So this is essentially their mental frames. They're maybe the, the knowledge, skills, the um, explicit knowledge that they gained from the home country, their connections. Um, and so all of this is part of the habitus, but we feel like we, we, we posited that it's actually heightened within this context of um, South Africa. And so the heightened habitus um, is an endogenous resource, which when it interacts with the local social networks, allows them to explore alternative ways. Again, the, the um, unique gut know-how as well as their home-based sense-making, allows them to explore unique and creative ways to mobilize resources. Um, and then to cre create external resources at hand and to overcome the liability of foreigners that exists within the host country social field. And so um, again, the, we use the same data from our South African, this first study that Aliera just described. 
And some of the key contributions here from this study um, are centered around the themes that I've been talking about. So several studies have looked at bricolage or resource mobilization, um, but there hasn't been an opportunity to actually theorize bricolage that incorporates post-country environments that are adversarial, that are especially against foreign national residents. And so in this study, we present this complexity around the host country social field that can be generalizable to other nations that have some of these rising nationalistic or conservative values. Um, another contribution here we have is that home matters and not just the fact that it matters, but how it matters, right? Again, we looked at these two different dispositions, adaptive, but also cognitive. Um, and we also note that the increased resilience or the, sorry, the increased challenges actually sharpens their resilience, sharpens their agility and the ability to adapt to challenging situations. And then we also talk about the liability of foreigners, the social field, right? Where in other studies, foreignness is seen as liability, as something that they have to overcome. But in our study, we found that it actually doesn't impose an objective reality, that um, these individuals were not, because they weren't as tied to the host country's way of doing things, their habitus does not allow them to conform to the pressures of local norms and actually allows them to identify new or alternative ways of using resources, the bricolage process. And then finally, um, again, we believe that these insights are very timely. There's a lot of discourse around immigration, around economic inclusion, around um, uh, welcoming diverse or culturally based mental frames within a nation's entrepreneurial community. And, um, and so we felt like it was particularly relevant to these times. Um, all right, and then our last study, I'm looking at the time, we're gonna look at, uh, it's actually in process right now, um, we look at entrepreneurs who are addressing some environmental challenges in the Kenyan context. And this is a paper that's currently in the revision process in one of the more highly regarded entrepreneurship journals in the management field. So Elliot is gonna talk a bit about that as well. Great, and great. So this paper is a, um, it's a, it's a pleasant shift um, and interrogation from our trend of work thus far. Thus far, our emphasis has been on the, the provocateur of our studies have been the, the discriminatory or charged social environment um, that has compelled entrepreneurs to have to build their ventures in certain ways because people have prejudiced um, or discriminatory attitudes and practices. But here, the, 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 um, the provocateur is the environment, is the natural environment. Um, and so we, and we also shift our geographic focus as well. So the last two papers are based upon research, uh, based upon data that was generated, um, primary data generated from South Africa and, and specifically the urban uh, regions. So we looked at the metropolis of Johannesburg and Gauteng province and then the metropolis of Cape Town in the Western Cape. Here we moved to Kenya. We moved to the eastern part of, of, of the African continent. And we are developing this paper with our co-author Norma Juma, who is at Washburn University. And one of the things that that one of the trends that the region has seen is this increased um, ecological degradation that is due to shifting climatic and environmental patterns. A big problem, however, because the region, as is the case with uh, many countries across the African continent, highly re relies economically on agriculture. Um, moreover, more and more communities also rely on, on the natural environment for their livelihoods. So not even to cultivate uh, produce at bulk to export or to send to market, but literally to live day to day. And so this land degradation, as our colleague was mentioning before, is compelling individuals to have to base their life upon smaller and smaller plots of land while population is still increasing and is also challenging the way by which the 
Kenyan government is able to strategize with regards to long term sustainable uh, practices. And so as the environment is shifting and is creating um, disruptions in the climate, disruptions in land, disruptions in food cultivation, uh, local entrepreneurs or local residents, I would say, who are who rely on the on the natural elements and on the natural resources have had to uh, press into uh, community-based innovative practices in order to see how they can navigate this this problem. And so it has then sparked the emergence of what is referred to in the literature as the eco ecopreneurial community, ecopreneurs. So entrepreneurs who are focused primarily on generating and creating value as it relates to the natural environment. Um, what we're also, the trend that we're also seeing is that the conversation at, at thus far oftentimes categorizes ecopreneurs and other entrepreneurs who demonstrate their dependence on the natural environment as sustenance entrepreneurs as well, as those that are quite emergent, small scale, and, high, and hence um, highly vulnerable to um, economic depravity if indeed their ventures don't work. Um, there's also the expectation, the underlying assumption that they remain small and that they only produce for immediate consumption. And what we were seeing in this data is that these were entrepreneurs who may have started at small scale, but in doing so, we're increasingly identifying opportunities by which to expand and by which to even move some of their innovations into other neighboring communities. And so we realized that as per the the charge for innovative activity to happen from the ground up, that the um, that the government has created a infrastructure, regulatory infrastructure, so as to so as to enable and to invite certain stakeholders in order to create an environment that could further support these ecopreneurs. And hence, now our level of analysis moves from the venture itself and the founder of the venture to the system that was being developed on a nationwide level and concentrated in particular regions that were under, um, that were under particular ecological threat in order to support local entrepreneurs that are seeking to develop solutions um, to address the, the natural environment's degradation. Um, and so here, hence then, we draw from the theories of the entrepreneurial ecosystem. Our colleague before emphasized, uh, emphasized the ecological ecosystem. As many of you on this call may know, that term is being adapted by the management and more specifically the entrepreneurship field to speak to the identification of different stakeholders, norms, and resources. Um, and then the systems and the processes that link them together in order to create a synergistic effect that now uh, um, props up an enabling environment for, or at least ideally, an enabling environment for entrepreneurial activity. And our data was revealing that this type of entrepreneurial ecosystem is emerging in parts of Kenya in response to these ecological challenges. And so as we're using now a systems lens, look at it, uh, looking at entrepreneurship as a system, which is the big focus of entrepreneurial ecosystem literature, as opposed to looking at it as a single action or as a single venture, we then find it very useful to also incorporate the perspective of strategic networks. So how particular stakeholders that were enabled by governmental oversight and regulatory enablement how those stakeholders were able to connect people together in order to um, create this environment. Um, our research question has been exciting, trying to understand how these shifts ecologically are informing the shifts of systemically within a country and the implications that that has for local entrepreneurs to not only be able to not only be viable in the market, but to also be effective in addressing and preserving the natural environment. We have collected data um, across uh, specific regions of Kenya on multiple levels. So data, primary data that was collected from uh, entrepreneurs as well as from institutional uh, leaders and representatives, both on the public and corporate and nonprofit end. Also secondary data has been used 
um, in order to understand the broader um, kind of infrastructure of environmental uh, that has been put in place to address the environmental and ecological trends. Um, and as you see with the nature of their, our work, who love the data to speak to us. And so we very much immerse ourselves qualitatively into this rich qualitative data to capture those patterns of themes of codes and hence um, conceptual categories and themes with the hope that it could provide the building blocks of some sort of theoretical assertions that could drive and inspire research going forward. Where we are right now and what we're really intrigued with unfolding and unraveling is understanding how these shifts in the, the natural environment and how the responsive action of government in terms of regulation, how they provide this kind of integrated overlay um, um, of the entrepreneurial environment within the country and how they serve as the backdrop to contextualize venture creation. We're intrigued as to how uh, looking at this at multiple levels, how entrepreneurial activity on the ground on the micro level, and then how this regulatory structure on the macro level are, are mediate, well, mediated may be a strong word, but they're facilitated or joined or better connected through a um, the actors, the organizational and inst institutional actors in the middle. And so kind of unveiling that hidden layer has been the joy of this research, kind of uncoup decoupling and uh, unlitting and delayering what is taking place on the organizational level that has been enabled by government, but is immediately interacting with entrepreneurs in order to formulate this ecosystem in a really effective way. And we're intrigued as to how this research is generalizable, how in other contexts where that environmental enabler is one that must be addressed because life depends upon it, what is the role of that intermediary or that broker or that middle hidden layer in order to um, facilitate um, resource access, knowledge um, sharing, um, and, and other forms of other enabling actors for the entrepreneurial base that has been endorsed by the government macro regulatory um, environment. All right, thank you, Ayata. So hopefully that's giving you a, just a glimpse about entrepreneurship within the continent. We looked at three different growth domains or themes um, with the entrepreneur. Um, we also looked at sort of conceptualizing the um, diasporic entrepreneur. We looked at, at the agency, the entrepreneurial agency, diasporic conceptualization, but also sustainability. And there's so many more, a lot more themes out there. This is just sort of where our research agenda has centered us. Um, but and I want to move and talk a bit about more about some emerging trends and some more research opportunities um, beyond additional research that's looking more closely at sustainability. And so um, I talked earlier about the growing informal economic sector when in looking at overview of the entrepreneurial landscape. But this is a huge sector that is essentially untapped, at least from a GDP perspective. Um, a lot of NGOs are focusing on this. A lot of um, proposals are trying to tap into this sector to seek and, and unravel and get a better understanding about um, how, how it's operating. And so with increased access to technology, with the younger population, um, just this, this is sort of a ripe opportunity to explore. And then um, the global supply chain. So, you know, the production of goods and services from raw materials is involving a lot more pieces across the globe. And Africa is becoming an increasing partner, playing an increasing role, central player in these global supply chain networks uh, beyond just outsourcing these items, right? So um, they actually are involved in interactions in business relations, um, supplier relations. And so because of this agricultural wealth that they have, you know, we talked earlier on about 90% being not arable, but agriculture being a big part of their, their economic um, resource. Coffee, cocoa, shea, the shea butter industry is huge, um, especially in the, over the last 20 or so years. Wine and other industries are opportunities to branch into new global markets, um, beauty, fashion, design, to name a few. So 
this is areas that many people are seeing, are seeing opportunities for Africa as well. And then um, increased potential for inclusive innovation. And so, um, you know, designing an innovation, innovation process that, again, taking into account individuals across varying levels, levels of access. So if one can imagine here, you, or in, in the States, or maybe in westernized environments, this idea of innovation is oftentimes aligned with you know, an elite group of individuals, tech, those who have access to technology or to rapidly dynamic environments. But um, this you know, inclusive innovation speaks more towards this diverse set of contributors, which suggests that the outcomes that are achieved are more accessible to many people as opposed to a select few. Um, whereas maybe in other contexts, innovation can be seen as a divider. In this case, innovation can be seen as being a bit more inclusive. Um, and then uh, not to beat a dead horse, but globalization, um, more travel, more technology. It just means that more and more African citizens are increasingly living, transitioning from multiple non-home experiences. And a lot of these different um, locales and experiences are informing their behavior. So there's actually a, a study that we've been very excited about, a future study that we're looking to explain more deeply about diving more deeply to understand um, the African citizenship and what that means for uh, entrepreneurial behavior, the multiple locales that they, they inhabit. And, and so uh, we'll stop there. This is just a, a glimpse into some of the work that we've been doing um, and that we're excited about. And uh, we'll open the floor now to questions. Thank you so much, Joy and Eladia. Um, again, you can, for questions, feel free to, to enter into the chat if you'd like to, or there's the Q&A tool, or you can use the hand raise tool and um, be able to use your microphone. One question I had for you um, when talking about that middle management, uh, management might nothing, but that, that middle sector group that um, and how important they are uh, in, in your findings. Are there um, aspects that are critical to, to have in place to kind of empower them to connect a little bit more, you know, to, um, to, to be successful in, in truly connecting in the way that you see, or are there, are there certain rules or policies or things in an organization that might sometimes be barriers for, for that group? Did I explain that well enough? I'm not sure that I'm, that I was fully getting my head around all of it. <laughs> Yeah, so that's, that is a great question. That really is. Um, it's part of what we have uh, been exploring further in terms of trying better to understand the nature of the government policy yeah. that then invited or enabled certain organizations and specifically NGOs with certain organizations to now become involved and um, to even drive or become leaders in the um, um, environmental sustainability efforts in, in Kenya. And so to your question, are there certain um, both broader kind of policy or institutional things that need to be in place in order to empower that middle, that hidden layer, um, as well as are there um, intrinsic factors that, that kind of are at play in order to enable them to do their work? And our, our hunch right now is yes. Um, we're intrigued by how there were efforts on the government level and then on the grassroots entrepreneurial level to address the environment. But um, over time, policy shifted now to uh, bring in these uh, other actors that were also well-resourced, that also had international connections um, to also help to facilitate uh, more support for local entrepreneurs. and. We are still exploring the, the gems that were provided by this middle layer to the local entrepreneurs that have now further capacitated them to, to, to truly generate value locally. And so, you know, that part will, it's like the sequel. <laughs> the yes. I love it. It's great. I'll, I'm excited to, to hear. And um, thank you. To, yeah, sorry. Just to add on to um, Eliada's response, and I think to uh, piggyback on something that Jan mentioned earlier on, 
I think something else that has made this hidden layer um, particularly effective is their approach. So they, they don't come in with the savior mentality. Like, I'm going to tell you what to do. Um, we, you know, we're experienced in this. In fact, I think one of the more powerful tools was them introducing other entrepreneurs to each other, especially those that had some synergistic resource opportunities where they could learn from each other. Um, and just, to say, just to sort of be a, we're here to help you. Yes, we have resources. Yes, we have accessibility to institutions, to universities, but you're, you're the expert in what you're doing. And so we're, we're here to provide some education, to provide some knowledge, some additional skills to help you do what you do even better. But I think that helped them to be even uh, well, exceptionally well received by the entrepreneurs. Thank um, you both, I, and for articulating my question so <laughs> beautifully. <laughs> right, I, I see um, Tony has a question. Hi, thanks for your presentation. It was great. Um, so I, I'm kind of curious, you did not actually mention specifically what um, ecological or climate change, you know, that you're dealing with. Um, and I just wanted to mention um, or ask about whether or not the, the African Great Lakes are, and the fisheries in particular, are uh, a, a topic that you've you know, kind of touched on, or you have data around that, because of course those are um, are belong to eleven different countries, and and it's a wide, you know, wide wide part of Eastern Africa, and uh, millions and millions of people uh, rely on the lakes, and they're facing climate change and you know various changes as we as we speak. Um, so just curious about. Anything you might have to say about that? Sorry, go. Yeah, no, I, I, and I'll, I'll speak and then you can go. Um, I, I will say that it was our, our other colleague who was more involved with the data collection process. And I think from speaking with her and also just from our, our understanding of, of, of um, the, the challenges, <laughs> the, I think it was primarily the, the, land, the dry, arid land and the fact that from what I understand about the location in Kenya, there wasn't, they weren't as close to the lakes. Um, and so the, the percentage of fertile soil that was available to farm continuously was increasingly decreasing every year. Um, and so there weren't any sort of irrigation tools to help preserve the arable land. Um, but that's a good question for us to, to loop back to her to find out a bit more about the role that um, the African Great Lakes played. Um. Yeah, no, thank you for, for, for bringing that up. Our main focus thus far has been land degradation more specifically as, as Joy has said, um, looking at the, the central regions, particularly the regions around um, Nairobi itself, a little bit, and then also a little bit further to the east. Um, and so with regards to the Great Lakes around the Rift Valley, the, that has been, um, in terms of the lived experience of entrepreneurs within the regions that we focused upon, it hasn't emerged as much in our data. Um, however, it is something definitely that um, we, we, we would love to further examine, especially as we're able to deepen the analysis of this paper. Um, but yes, to, to your question as to which type of environmental shifts we're looking at, it was primarily land degradation that has kind of invoked this call for action from uh, communities that are increasingly reliant on agricultural produce from the land. Okay, great, thanks. Sure. Any other final questions? I know um, I've seen a, a number of people saying excellent, excellent talks and presentations and, and thank you for the colloquium. We are at that two o'clock, but I think we are, uh, have a, another minute if we do have one more question. If not, I can just reiterate my thanks uh, to both of you for the time and, and sharing of your work with us and um, and everybody, and, and again, we'll make this recording available. Really excited to, to host this uh, for the very first time uh, here with RIT and, and look forward to 
um, continuing to share this information and highlight the, the wonderful work of um, our RIT faculty and colleagues um, in the US and around the world. So. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. With that, goodbye, everybody. I hope you have a wonderful afternoon and um, and look forward